Okay, uh, let's get started then. Um, thank you for coming to, to this talk. This is a little bit different. Um, hands up if you've, if you've seen me speak before about bytecode or internal subjects. A few people. It's kind of hard to tell under these big cinema lights, but it's always good fun to be uh, uh, back underneath them again. So the, the title of this talk is, uh, is Fantastic Bytecodes and How to Interpret Them. And you, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a few surprises for you ahead. Uh, I hope you like it. So for those of you who haven't met me before, uh, I'm Ben Evans. I've done a bunch of things in the community. I'm mostly associated with the London Java community, although I actually don't really live in London anymore. Um, over the years, I've been involved with the, the Java community process. Uh, I served on the executive committee for a while. Um, I've won a bunch of awards for, for speaking, and I'm a Java champion. Uh, in career terms, I've mostly done kind of finance and banking related things for the last 15 years. Um, apart from the fact that I, I founded a startup with Martin Verberg and Kirk Pepperdine about six years ago called JClarity, which is a performance and an optimization uh, with, through machine learning startup. But apart from that, I've, I've kind of mostly hung around banks, and um, these days I kind of do my own thing. So, what about this talk? Well, we're going on a bit of a journey, and there's going to have a few ground rules about what we're going to talk about and, and what we're not going to talk about. Um, the first ground rule is, oh, let's see if the pointer works. It does. We're only going to talk about the interpreter. So I'm not going to talk about JIT compilation. I'm not going to talk about uh, anything to, to do with how the VM may potentially warp or twist code after uh, interpretation. Purely, purely the interpreter. Okay? And for a surprising change, I'm not actually going to talk about garbage collection at all. Normally, when I give one of these talks about internals or about performance, or anything which goes on inside the VM, there's quite a lot I'll have to say about GC. And I think, I don't think there's anything at all I'm going to say about it today. Um, there, might, there might be one exception to that, depending on if we get to the demo at the end or not. Okay? And it's, it needs to be fun. And this is a really, really important point. Because you see, if this was one of my very typical technical talks, I'd probably show you, you know, a slide like this, which you know, is good in its own way. It shows you three of the four major subsystems of the JVM. You know, you have class loading, which is how new types enter the system. You have the interpreter and the method cache. So all the bytecode gets put into the method cache, it gets fed to the interpreter, the interpreter executes it for you, and then later on it gets JIT compiled. So in fact, this is, you know, a pretty good representation of what's inside the JVM, of course, not including the heap and garbage collection. But it's, you know, that's a, uh, a slide I might show you, but, you know, it's kind of boring, you know, and... I could also show you this slide, which is you know, a, a, a basic representation of how the, the memory layout of a, a Java process looks, at least on Unix. You, know, you can see that we've got the, the stack frames, which are the typical C stack frames of each individual thread. Within them, you've actually got the Java stack frames. And you've got the heap of the overall Unix process. And inside it, you have the Java heap, where your Java objects live, you know, all very kind of standard infographics that you might have seen in textbooks uh, and the like. And it, it's fine as far as it goes. But I wanted to do something a bit different. So here we have our JVM. And you can see that it's, you know, it's been used as a couple of other things in its, uh, in its history. You know, maybe some of you recognize where, where this JVM might have come from. And what's inside it? What's in the box? Well, these guys. Let's meet our bytecodes, or some of them. Yeah, some of them have their names above them, like this, uh, and some of them, some of them don't. You'll pretty quickly learn to recognise these little guys uh, by their by their shapes and their their headgear and their colours. So we'll get to know each of these in turn. Please don't be afraid of the you know the fact that they have really big teeth. You see, but you have to remember they are bytecodes. So what are they and what are they, where, where do they come from? Well, you, you probably know that, that basically um, where do bytecodes come from? They, they live in class files. And what are class files? Well, if you think about it, class files are frozen bytecodes. They're on ice. They're waiting to become live types. So one of the real powers of the JVM is that class loading will take this just stream of bytes, which is dead on the disk, and they'll turn it into a live and running type, which actually has some real uh, impact in the system. And so 
kind of try to do a, a high level view here. So we've lost some of the detail. We haven't actually quite seen all of the, the little intricacies of each bytecode here, but, but that's basically what's, what's going to be living inside our class files. There is, of course, more to it than that. As we'll see, a class file actually has a whole bunch of different sections. It's not just these guys. But when you think of a class file, typically it is the bytecodes and the executable code that we think about the most. OK, so far so good. Maybe we should try warming these guys up and actually getting them executing and seeing what they're, what they're going to do, right? There's one more thing we need to do first. We actually have to load them. And class loading, as you probably know, is fairly integral and very, very uh, uh, important part of the JVM. And of the different phases of, of class loading, and there, there are quite a few, there's one more than any other which stands out. Anybody know what it is? No? It's verification. And in our world, we're going to meet this guy, the verifier. And its job is to ensure that the class files that, that it sees are not damaged or flawed or malicious in some cases uh, before they're allowed into the JVM. And the way that this works is that the verifier actually has the power to completely reject a class file that you try to load. If you try to load something which is, which is damaged in some way, the verifier, if it doesn't like the, the, the format or it, it, it concludes that the, the file is not conforming properly to, the, to what the spec says, it will just discard it and you, know, you will get a class not found exception if you try and load it. So this guy will be responsible for, for actually trying to pull things in. It's also important to remember that um, Although as Java programmers, you're, you, you we typically just run JavaC and we get back a class file, and that's the, the thing that we're going to load. If you were sufficiently clever, you could actually write a class file from scratch. You could actually write something which conformed to the, the, the appropriate sequence of bytes, you know, the header and the, the various data structures which are laid out within the class file. But then you could write sequence of bytes which will never be produced by JavaC. And so you can try to break the rules. And you can try to twist things and see if you can manipulate the platform into doing something that it's not supposed to do. The verifier, its job is to make sure that, that if you try to do that, well, if you break the rules of the, of, the, of the file format and you break the rules of the JVM, your code is just not going to be allowed to, uh, to be accepted and to run. So the verifier confirms that the class file is sound, that it conforms to expectations, and there's no attempt to cause any kind of illegal runtime problem. Okay, what else do we, are we going to do at this point? We can move certain types of runtime check that we would otherwise have to do while the program was running and to actually impact the, the performance of your executing application thread. Certain types of check we can actually move into the class loading phase. I'll give you one example access control. When you call a Java method at runtime, no access checks are ever performed, uh, with the exception of reflection. If you do it reflectively, then OK, then the, uh, the, the JVM has to step in and make sure you're not trying to do something naughty. Um, but for regular method calls, which are non-reflective, you don't do any checks. Why not? Well, because the checks have already been done. The verifier has already gone through, and made sure that each time in the bytecode where you try to call another method, that you actually have the correct access control to do so. So those, those call sites, as we're going to call them, Actually, every single one of them has been checked to make sure that its access control is, uh, is correct. And if it's not, well, guess what? The verifier checks you out. Just one, one of the other examples of how, uh, how it will um, fail to load if things are not correct. So this is kind of an, an important point, because what, what the verifier is doing is it's providing us with this really strong security pinch point, if you like. Everything which comes into the JVM has to come through the verifier and pass that process. So it's a very strong point for security. Uh, and that's, that means that the, the, the platform can invest a lot of uh, attention and detail to making sure those verification checks are correct. We do a lot more work up front in that, in that phase, in verification and in class loading, in order so that we can be, be sure that once you're inside, that everything works correctly and doesn't try to break the rules. So you get better performance at runtime. You also get a, a nice hard point for security. So I think those are kind of two of the things which mean that the, the JVM's um, security and, and class loading design is actually pretty sound. You know, this model has now been around for well over 20 years, and no serious problems have ever been found with the model. OK, sure, there have been bugs in the code. Guess what? Software has bugs. Software always has bugs in it. But there is a difference between a bug in the implementation and a bug in the specification. After 22 years, I think most people are pretty 
convinced that the, the JVM's model, the actual specification for the security, is actually pretty good. Okay, so what else can we say? Well, let's just meet the out, outlying uh, anatomy of an overall class file. These are the different sections of data that you'll find in any, any class file. Starting at the top with the magic number, all Unix files, uh, which are well known to the system, have a magic number. Um, in Java's case, it's the rather unfortunate and quite sexist, in my opinion, Cafe Babe. Um, different world 22 years ago, um, but we, I guess we're kind of stuck with this one now. Uh, except, of course, if you are looking at Java 9 or 10, as I suppose I should say now, the new magic number for that is actually Cafe Dada, which is named after a, a, a famous Paris, Parisian cafe. So for modules, we get a proper magic number. Anyhow, after that, we have the minor and major version numbers. Now, this is kind of important because there are very different versions of the class file, and each new version of Java which comes out has a different meaning for, for what a class file should contain. Um, so, for example, if some of you may know about stack map tables, version 6 and below, no stack map tables. From version 7 onwards, you have to have them. So the rules for verification, the rules for what constitutes a legal class file actually vary from version to version. Okay, so how does the verifier know which set of rules to apply? It looks at the magic number, uh, not the magic number, the version number, and checks to make sure that it has the appropriate set of rules loaded. Okay, next up, we'll find the constant pool. This is gonna be really important. We'll meet the constant pool properly in a second, but that's a really big area of, of, of useful data about the class file. It means all of the things which the, the, the class needs to operate correctly. References to fields, um, other classes it might need, as well as that actual constants, you know, like a, a numeric constant like pi or a, a string constant, all of that stuff is going to live in the constant pool. Then we'll have some metadata, the access flags, the name will indicate what our superclass is, and then we'll have some descriptions of the interfaces and fields which are in the class, and then finally the methods. So the actual bytecode, the actual meat of the class file that we, that we typically think of, actually only comes down here at the end. And then finally, after the method bytecode, we'll have any attributes. And those are you know, just additional bits of tact or metadata, if you like. Um, and I can't remember where this, uh, this uh, mnemonic, this memory aid comes from. Uh, I first started seeing it floating around the internet about seven or eight years ago. Um, and it's, this is how you remember what all of the different sections of the class file are called. You know, so you just have to remember about, has, has anyone seen the movie Gremlins? Yeah, well, this is kind of like a, a gremlin cat, I think. It's, it's kind of cool. Okay, so those are our uh, basic anatomy of a class file. Um, we know that we need to, to verify the, the bytecode of methods as we go through. We need to make sure we have access control properly. We need to make sure that you call methods with the right static types. You know, if, you, if you, you're calling um, some method on um, string and you pass it uh, a Java Lang integer, well, that's not gonna work. But you should be able to, to detect that at, at, uh, at class loading time. And in fact, the verified does. It will go and make sure that the only appropriate parts of the, 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 the methods that are called are on the correct, uh, on the correct static types. It'll also check that we are, we're assigning correctly typed values. Um, and there's, there's a kind of interesting point here. The JVM actually is less strongly typed, actually I shouldn't say strongly typed, less statically typed than you might think. Yeah, it's not a fully dynamically typed language at JVM level. You can't, for example, take a, an object and load it into a variable that's expecting an int. That's not allowed. Maintains the split between primitive types and reference types. But any variable can contain any reference type. Effectively, the reference part of the type system is dynamically typed at bytecode level. Or if you like, the type of every variable, every local variable that you have, could be thought of as object. Now, only local variables. That doesn't work for fields, but for local variables, you can do that. Javac won't. Javac will actually produce some very pedantic bytecode where it actually preserves the static type information in the, the, the variables as well. But for the, for the actual bytecode, if you were writing bytecode from scratch, hell, you can do whatever you like. So that's, that's kind of interesting that, that actually that this, the world that we're, we're going to be looking at within the JVM is, is very different. It's not bound by precisely the same rules as the Java language itself. What else have we got? Well, we've got the fact that the JVM is a stack machine. So that means that we can 
we can, well, there's actually two separate sets of stacks, as we'll see. But the first set of stacks uh, that we'll look at is the evaluation stack, or sometimes called the local evaluation stack, which is present in each method. When you open up a new method, you get a new evaluation stack. You put temporary computations and things which are partway done onto the stack. You manipulate that stack to actually carry out computation. Now, the reason why the JVM is like this is, is a couple of reasons. First of all, you've got to remember how old it is. It came out in 1995, and the work which was going on into the JVM and which ultimately led to, to the Java project had been going on for several years before that. Stack machines are easy to implement, even on limited hardware. So that's the first good reason for it. Secondly, they're easy to make platform independent. And remember that in the early days of Java, this platform independence and the fact that Java code could run across a whole range of different operating systems and platforms was a, a big deal, okay? So why are, are stack machines so easy to, to, to move to different platforms? Well, because they're easy to implement. You're not tied to a particular register architecture of one particular CPU. You know, that leads to all sorts of uncomfortable things like, well, what happens if I move to a different CPU platform and it's got fewer registers? How do I remap all that, all that uh, compiled code to work on a different register architecture? Yeah? Or even if it doesn't have a different number of registers or fewer, what happens if it have, has more? Am I not leaving massive amounts of performance on the, on the table by only using half the registers of my target platform? Stack machines don't have that problem because there are well-known techniques for taking a stack machine and mapping it down to, to registers. So, so for, for, for those kind of reasons, um, the stack nature is important. It also turns out to be very helpful for our old friend, the verifier, because when you're verifying, you can actually walk through a program and check the types which are present on the stack at any point in the, in the code. And you can check to make sure that each bytecode is going to see the stack types that it expects. So again, for verification and for security purposes, very, very useful. OK. One other thing to remind you of, just, uh, just before we move on and actually, actually do some things a bit, which are a bit more fun, uh, is what I sometimes call the transitive closure of, of classes. When you load a class, the verifier can't determine whether or not it's actually OK until it's also loaded all of the other classes that your original class refers to. OK? So just think about that for a second. I try to load my class. Well, it's got a two-string method. OK? So I need to make sure that string's loaded. Well, string's in the JDK, so that's fine. But it also refers to another one of my classes. Well, I can't know that the original class was safe until I've checked the other class. So I have to stop what I'm doing, load that class, and go and check that. Oh, yeah, but this thing now refers to another class over there, so I have to stop what I'm doing, go and load that. So what you end up with, of course, is effectively a depth-first traversal of the, the graph of types, if you like. Everything which I refer to and which my, my reference refer to, and so on and so on and so on, has to be loaded. And I sometimes illustrate this like this by thinking about object. Java Lang object, of course, has in its definition a bunch of other classes that it refers to. It refers to string. It refers to class, because the class type is the return type of get class. Yeah? It refers to uh, class loader indirectly via class. So it's class loader. Uh, object will also refer to throwable, and so on and so on. So you can imagine that if I ever tried to, to load object, I would also have to bring into scope all of these other classes as well. So that's worth remembering about, about class loading in some of what we're going to talk about. OK, so far so good. Let's, um, let's remember our box. I promise to show you what's inside it. Well, here's what's inside it. This is what, what's inside your JVM. I'll explain what all the different pieces are. Now, a couple of these, I hope, are quite obvious. What do you think this is? What does it look like? It's, uh, it's the heap, right? Of course it is. This one is a little, uh, I've given you a clue here. I've actually written the name on this. On the, on this. this is the method cache. And it's a freezer. This is where we're going to keep all of those frozen bytecodes that we're actually going to execute. OK, and there we are. I've uh, actually laid out a method's worth of bytecodes. Notice how they're all in the one ice cube tray. All of our methods are going to be single ice cube trays, which are going to contain some stuff. Yeah, so we've got a heap. 
We've got a store of, of code that we could execute. We've also got a couple of other things here. First of all, we've got, yeah, a constant pool. Um, in reality, of course, these are actually per class, but that would get too messy. And I think it's kind of nice just to show the constants as a single pool here. Um, what else have we got? So what does that leave? We've got this, this tower block here. Anyone want to have a guess what that is? No? Yeah, these are the program frames, absolutely. These are the stack frames of our individual code. Each of these is going to be a different method in our call stack. We'll look inside one of those in a second and see what's there. So the JVM is a stack machine. It has no registers, and it has three main data areas. It has a local evaluation stack, which is private or local to a particular method. It has local variables, which again are private or local to an individual method. And it has a shared heap, which is where the objects live. And that's shared not only between each individual method, but between each thread as well. And I suppose that we could actually put up another tower block next to this one, which would be another thread. The same data areas would still all be shared. The only thing that would be different is that there would be another stack next to this one. Still have a shared heap, still have a shared constant pool, and a shared source of data. So one of the things which we should introduce here is the program counter. Yeah, and what's that? Well, it kind of, I hope it looks a little bit like the, uh, the claw from Toy Story. Anyone seeing that? Well, hopefully a little bit. And what its job is to take each bytecode out of the ice cube tray, out of the array of bytecodes that are present, and execute them one by one. But if you think about it, if you studied interpreters or compilers at university, that's exactly how a basic interpreter is built up. You take a byte from the stream, examine it, switch on it, execute that byte code, loop round, take the next one from the stream. What, just byte after byte, the, the claw is going to come in here, grab these guys and execute them, which will enable us to walk through the stack machine like this. So we'll be able to execute some program code that looks a little like this on top of the stack machine by executing each bytecode in turn. OK, so far so good. Now let's actually see some of our bytecodes in context. What about this guy? What can we say about him? Well, sure enough, I've got an evaluation stack. And that evaluation stack has got different sorts of entry on it. Yeah? We've got this some number which starts 0x3a. What's that going to be? Oh. Memory address. Yeah. And just in case you're in any doubt, he's got a big A on him to show you what his, um, what his type is. So this bytecode is some sort of bytecode that handles addresses, sure enough. And apparently the purple boxes color code, and they, they are the ones which hold addresses. And what's he doing? He's reaching down and taking something from the shelf, something in position one. So he's taking an address from the first local variable, and he's going to put it on the stack here. And of course, if you look out, In the background, you can see the heap and the constant pool through the open door. So this shows us two of our forms of, of storage. We've got local storage of addresses, local storage of integers, local storage of doubles. You can probably guess that there would be also be storage of other types of primitive type, but I've, we would have run out of colors if we'd done that. Just showing the three most common ones, addresses, ints, and doubles. I think makes the, uh, makes the point here. And we can build up the local evaluation stack, which sits on this blue tile here, which basically enables us to, um, to calculate locally within a method. So that's what lives inside our frames. And if you look, it's actually just as promised. It's, uh, 
two of these types of storage that we, we talked about. Okay, so now let's, um, let's go and actually meet some bytecodes. There are, of course, 255, I suppose technically 256 bytecodes, but one of them is the no-op, which doesn't really count because there are only that num any number of, of different bytes available to us. As of Java 10, there are 205 available. And you're looking at that number and you're thinking, wow, that sounds like a lot. That sounds like bytecode is really, really complicated. It's really not. There are a few exceptions and a few opcodes that I won't talk about today. But actually, we're going to meet just five families of opcodes, or five clades, if you like, uh, which basically make up all of those 205 near enough, okay? Because what happens is that certain aspects of bytecode, like type safety, remember how I said that the primitive types were still visible in bytecode, even if the, um, the object types aren't really. The fact that we need to have um, some operations which are aware of what types they're operating on, are they operating on a double, are they operating on an int, there are some bytecodes that need to know that. So what that leads to is a great duplication of what is effectively the same capability. So the type safety blows up the number of bytecodes we have. We also have what are called shortcut forms. And we've already actually met one of these. And we've already met one here. This bytecode, by the way, has got a name. Uh, this is a load one. And the reason it's called a load is because, well, it deals with addresses. So it's a type A. It's loading because it's taking something off the shelf and putting it onto the stack. So it's loading onto the stack. And it's actually got this little ticket up here which says that it's number one. And what that means is it's dealing with the first local variable. So zero, one, two, three. Now that means that we can represent this with just one byte. Normally when we do loading, we would actually have to have another byte which says which local variable we'd be operating on. But with this guy, we're actually gonna do it with just a single opcode, no other space is required. We'll talk about why we want to do that in, in a sec, but basically this, this usage of a, a, a dedicated bytecode for this is another way that we inflate the number of opcodes that, are, that, are, um, that exist. So when you see 205, don't think, oh, this is daunting, I'll never get to, to memorize 205 different bytecodes. You don't have to memorize them all. Um, once you've seen the basic families, you'll be able to read it pretty clearly. And if you ever need to look at the details, you just look it up online. You know, in just the same way as we don't memorize the full APIs that we have for, for all of the Java um, uh, SDK, we don't memorize all the bytecode either. Okay, so as promised, we have, uh, we have five different families or five different clades, um, and we're going to meet each of these in turn. First up, and the, surprisingly, when I was actually <clears throat> doing the research for this, I was surprised to learn that this is actually the largest of all the clades. The largest family of, of, of any of the, the five is actually the one which does all the storing and loading. So there are two basic variants to this. There's the loading one, which we've already met. And you can see his hand's on the left because he's gonna be reaching from the, from the shelf and placing on the, on the stack. Of course, there's also the other possibility, which is you might take something from the stack and store it into a local variable. One thing to notice is that when you take from local storage, or indeed from fields, which we'll meet in a sec, and put onto the top of the stack, what you're taking is a copy. You don't destroy the contents of that, you don't empty it out, you simply copy the bit pattern onto the stack. When you take something from the stack, you actually take it off the stack. So you actually destroy what's present on the stack each time you take it off. So that's important to remember. And sure enough, this is the, the A store, which is the, the mirror image of that one, operating on a slightly different local variable. So here are some of the, the main members of this family, if you like. And we, there we go, there's load and store. These both take uh, types, so there's typed bytecodes, and they'll store you know, appropriate um, values on and off the stack. We also have some, some other ones as well. We have uh, LDC. Now LDC is gonna get something out of the constant pool, which is kind of different, because notice that the constant pool isn't, um, isn't within the local uh, data area at all. It's gonna need to reach outside. 
So we'll, we'll have a look at that in a sec. We also have things like get field and put field. Again, this is going to reach into the, uh, into the heap rather than local storage, and it's going to manipulate values which are stored on the stack here in this method and either bring values in from objects or write back to objects which are present in the heap. And this basically, this, this clade gives rise to 77 opcodes. So over one third of all of the operations that we're going to do is, um, is actually here in this particular family. Turns out there are 33 different store instructions, 33 different loads, six different versions of this duplication opcode, which is, I had no idea it was that many until I actually checked. Um, and then we have get field and put field here. Now these aren't typed. You don't need to say, I'm getting a field and it's an int, because you, you're speaking about uh, a specific field on a particular type, and so you can look up. You always know what type that is. That's guaranteed to be type safe. Um, so you don't need typed variations of these. Um, there's also get static and put static, which do the same thing as these two, but obviously for static fields rather than, rather than for object ones. So here's what our, our storing looks like. And what's happened is that this, uh, this chap here has taken off this int and is about to overwrite this variable location here. And I've kind of dropped off all the other data points apart from the, the integers here, or the ints, I should say, is simply just to make it a bit easier to read. So we're just going to overwrite entry zero with this, this number. OK, and also, of course, I promised you that there would be an LDC. And where's he going to be taking things from? Well, you can see the fishing line straight out of the constant pool. So he's going to be able to go in and reach a value out of that constant pool and bring it and put it on the stack. So when you see an LDC option, this is, this is, um, <coughs> this is uh, what it's going to do. Th this one's actually kind of interesting because it, well, for two things. First of all, it's not typed. As you can see, he's not sporting any snazzy kind of belt with any type information on it. So he can get any kind of constant you like. It could be a numeric constant. It could be a string. And you're thinking, why would we, why would we care about that? That doesn't sound very interesting. And here is one of the, the, the kind of fascinating things about bytecode, is that until about Java 4 or Java 5, you'd be absolutely right. And this was boring as hell, because there was nothing of particular interest in the constant pool apart from numbers and, and, and strings. As time has gone on, and as the versions of Java have become more complicated, especially since Java 7, the contents of the constant pool have now got much more interesting. And in fact, does anyone know what the, one of the features confirmed for Java 11, one of the only things we know about that's definitely going in? It's a thing called class dynamic, or const dynamic, rather. And it basically will enable us to have uh, incredibly powerful uh, VM techniques within the constant pool itself and direct access to, to some very, very advanced VM tricks. So I kind of like that. I mean, this, this guy was kind of, you know, a bit of a nothing byte code. And yet, with successive generations of the VM, it started to get a lot more interesting and a lot more exciting. Something else, you might want to get or put things from the, uh, from the heap. So here is get field. And as you can see, he's got really long arms because he has to reach all the way over there. He has to go and put something into the heap or, or to reach into an object and pull back the value of a field and put it onto the, the stack that he's got within his own little house here. OK, so let's see if everyone's, anyone's still awake. <coughs> it's a little puzzle here. What does this one do? This sequence of byte codes. Anybody want to take a, take a guess and tell me what this is going to do? You might have to get yes at the back here. Yeah, it's a duplication. Because what's happening here, you see, is we've got this A byte code, which is going to operate on an address, uh, i.e. an object reference. And it's going to put it into variable slot 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to take whatever's on the top of the stack, which isn't an object reference, put it in slot 2. 
And then the next two byte codes are both going to do the same thing. They're going to take what's in two, and it's, a, it's an address, and put it back on the stack twice. So effectively, what this is is a typed duplicator. Um, in practice, we actually don't need to type our duplicator, but it shows us that what we can do with our opcodes is we could actually get away without a lot of the opcodes we actually have that are present in bytecode. A lot of it can be duplicated or synthesized, if you like, by building up sequences of other opcodes. So it's just another reminder that actually, you know, don't be daunted by the set of bytecodes. There's actually not uh, that much that's going on here at all. Okay, let's meet the next clade, which are the arithmetic bytecodes. Uh, and these guys basically are, they're all typed, uh, and they all operate directly on the stack. So this one is going to be an addition bytecode, uh, which operates on doubles, or DAD. Uh, this one is going to be a floating point subtraction operation. So this will require both operations on the, on the stack, the both uh, entries, the top two, to both be floating point. Uh, and this one is going to be an IMALT. And again, in all cases, both the top two elements must be of the same type. You can't do, for example, an IMALT where one of them's a double. You'd have to actually perform some kind of casting operation first. So let's see what they, what they look like. <clears throat> so basically, there are just these four types. There's one other one. Um, there's, there's REM for remainder, or which you probably know from integer division. And then you have the casting ones, which are called things like uh, I2D. So if I wanted to add an int and a double, for example, what I would do is load the int. So I'd do an I load. I'd do I2D to turn it into a, a, a double. I'd load the other double, so do a D load, and then I would do a D add. It would be illegal for me to just load the int, load the double, and then try to do a D add on them. It just, it just won't work. The verifier will reject you. So there are these kind of low-level operations that are, that are also present for, to make everything work for, uh, for arithmetic. Okay, so bear in mind that each of these forms here, and REM, of course, needs uh, four separate uh, opcodes for each one, which are the four different numeric types that we want to deal with. So integer, long, um, double, and float. And it turns out that there are actually 15 different casting opcodes which you need to cope with all of the trans possible translations from all different primitive types to other primitive types as well. Okay? So these arithmetic types are kind of boring, but they actually account for 35 different bytecodes. You take that together with the 77 that we saw for storing and loading, and we are well over halfway to accounting for all of our bytecodes. There's really not a great deal left. So let's see what else we could, uh, we could look at. Okay, the branches. Okay, and this is a, a good point to introduce a very important difference between the way that the JVM runtime works and the way that bytecode works versus C. You know, in machine code, you can jump anywhere, right? You can just jump to another point in memory. You know, it doesn't matter. You just put in any old number you like and just say, I'm going to call the code that starts there. That might be garbage, and you, if you're lucky in that case, you'll get a segmentation fault or some other kind of horrendous error. Um, if you're unlucky, you'll get silent corruption and your program will eventually get into a horrible state. In bytecode, you can't do that. In bytecode, you actually separate out two different operations. You can jump locally, which means that you can... Where is my pointer? You can take hold of the claw. And you can move it backwards and forwards along the ice cube tray you're currently in by jumping. But you can't move outside of it. That it will be a verification error to try to move the claw to a position outside of this method. To try to jump locally outside of the, outside of the number of bytes that are present in, in, this, uh, in this verified method is, is an error. You're not allowed to do that. Alternatively, you can invoke an entirely separate method, but you have to use an invoke opcode to do that. The two, the two different capabilities, locally branching and looping versus actually calling a new method, are completely separate, and you can't do anything to make the JVM confuse them. Again, it's another security point. Um, some other virtual machines out there, um, notably 
Has anyone used the Ethereum virtual machine? Anyone? No. I Ethereum doesn't have this design, so uh, which is, in my opinion, one of the big weaknesses uh, of that virtual machine. Um, but here we do, and it's a very neat, um, neat capability to have. What that means is we end up with some flow control that looks like this. Um, we have ifs and go-tos, which basically are specialized forms of if, and there's actually about 16 of them which do all of the, uh, the different um, potential if conditions you might think of. Uh, we also have JSR and RET, which are actually two opcodes which have been deprecated. They're not seen after Java 6 anymore. They actually turn out to be not very friendly to JIT compilation and to other things. So actually, for modern versions of Java, the, the Java just doesn't produce these anymore. And I think the verifier will actually reject your class if you try. So if you produce something which claims to be a version 7 or a version 8 class file, and it's got one of these in, you'll get chucked out. Um, and then there's also another couple to do with, with how switches are implemented. That's kind of you know, very low-level detail. Uh, n most programmers don't need to worry about that too much. So here we have 16 different if forms. Um, notice that what we have are, is going to depend on, on what's actually um, present on the, on the stack. And suppose that we're doing something like we're testing an int against a constant. What do you do? You push the constant, um, you push the value you're testing, and then you apply the if byte code, which basically takes the top two elements and compares them. And depending on which of these actual conditions you, you have will determine whether or not you actually execute the jump or not. And if you, if you stare at this list of, of 16 opcodes for long enough, you'll probably convince yourself that any test you could write for an if condition in Java code will get turned into one of these. Obviously, a, you know, a complex Boolean expression with lots of ands and, and, and ors and brackets in it will become a much more complex sequence of bytecode, but any basic test will be turned into one of these. Oh, one other thing I should also say from this slide, this is all you've got in bytecode. There are no more complex forms. There are no for loops. There are no while loops. For those of you that know about Scala, um, there are no ways to build different control structures other than these. Everything in bytecode boils down to this very, very basic forms of flow control. There's, there's just no other way to do it. OK, so all of that is kind of low level. Let's meet some more uh, higher level stuff and some things where, where we actually have some uh, interesting things happening. And that means probably the most powerful clade of all are the invokers. You can always tell these guys because they have their little hard hats. And what does invocation do? Well, according to the plan, it lowers into place a new frame. That's what happens when you call a method, isn't it? You actually get a new set of local variables and local evaluation stack, which is placed on top of the existing stack. Whatever's going on in here stops, and control transfers into the top of the stack. That's, that's method evaluation for you. That's how it works. And there are actually five of these. Um, but they're, they're, for, for reasons which we'll discover in a second, they're actually best thought of as four plus one. Yeah? So here they are. Um, and basically, they're, they're known as the, the invoke opcodes. Invoke static, invoke virtual, invoke interface, and invoke special. And we'll, we'll talk, to, talk to them sort of one at a time. Let's start with the easy one. Invoke static. Well, everybody knows how invoke static works. There's no what, what sometimes called a receiver object. A receiver object is just the instance that the method is being called on. Static methods, no instance, so no receiver object. Um, when you call a static method in Java, Javac knows exactly what bit of bytecode is going to get called at compile time. So when I say that it's fully known at compile time, that's what I mean. That we can be certain which sequence of bytecode is going to get called um, at the time when this method is created. And what else is, is true of statics? Well, they can't be overridden. Yeah, this is just your basic. And if I was writing another language to target the JVM, let's suppose I was writing some very, very simple procedural scripting language, which wasn't even OO. You know, I could actually write it so that all of my, my um, method invocations get turned into invoke static. You know, this would be a very simple way to, 
to implement a language um, using bytecode. Okay, uh, next one up. And I'm actually doing these in a slightly different order, basically because of the complexity of them. Invoke special. Now this has a receiver object, uh, but its destination, the sequence of bytecodes it's gonna call, is known at compile time. Yeah? So have I got any C++ programmers in the room? Hands up for anyone, that, yeah. So as you probably have, have figured out, this is non-virtual dispatch. Yes, the JVM does have non-virtual dispatch at bytecode level. Uh, it's just not the default, and it's not the one that we normally use. Um, the destination is known, so I kind of think it shouldn't really be called invoke special. I would actually call this exact dispatch. So if I'd been writing the bytecode spec all those years ago, um, I would probably have called this invoke exact as well. Um, it doesn't do overriding. It doesn't do any kind of runtime lookup whatsoever. It knows what it's going to be calling at compile time. Does anyone want to take a guess as to what kind of method might need this dispatch to work properly? Private, very interesting point. Um, and for that, you and a book. Um, because the private case is actually one which is just being modified. In Java 10, you're quite correct. An invoke, uh, an invoke special will be um, dispatched for a, a private. However, Java 11 brings in something which you might have heard of called nestmates. Anyone heard of nestmates? No, what this thing is, is it's finally fixing a 20-year-old piece of technical debt in how inner classes are implemented. And when that happens, it turns out that you actually require private methods to be dispatched with invoke virtual. So there's an interesting point. If you want to hear more about that, and we don't have time to talk about it now, if you want to hear more about that, please come and see me at the end. Okay, good. One book down. Two more to give away. Hoping for some good questions. Invoke it virtual. This is the big one. This is the, 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 the workhorse of the platform. This is the most common invoke. Typically, it depends on your workload, roughly 95% of all method calls you do will be dispatched using this. So there is a huge advantage to treating this as a fast path. Uh, and, and this basically will, will do all the overriding and all of the things that we expect. We also have uh, Invoke Interface. And Invoke Interface is um, uh, related to Invoke Virtual. Um, again, it's not fully known at compile time. It's going to potentially do some overriding. Also, it needs to do additional lookup. Um, if we had more time, I'd show you how this is laid out at a low level and why the VM implements it this way. Um, but it's needed to make interfaces work. And of course, if we had time to talk about JIT compilation, I could talk about type sharpening or data flow analysis and show you that in many cases, when you actually execute these, they get turned back into invoke virtuals. But it's needed for some corner cases. Ah, the interesting one, invoke dynamic. Invoke dynamic is, is, is special. Yeah. So he's wearing this kind of dark wizard cloak here. Um, th there's no receiver object. Um, invoke dynamic is not determined at all at compile time. The destination for the call is determined purely at runtime. And it actually uses a bootstrap method, uh, as they're called. And what this basically means is, um, if you look at any of the invokes, that one, there's a blueprint. Invoke dynamic doesn't have a blueprint. Instead, what happens is invoke dynamic magics up another frame, which is the bootstrap method. This frame returns you a blueprint. And it's then dispatched using the blueprint, which comes back from calling the special magic frame. Um, this is the first, only bytecode that ever to have been introduced in the platform. It was introduced in Java 7. And it's one of the spooky things is that this turns out to be a, a, a very much the future of the platform. Um, Lambda expressions are implemented using this. Uh, increasing amounts of the, of the, the, the framework, um, including things like default methods, are implemented using this. There are no way that you can write Java code to directly get this, and you, don't, you can't access this bytecode directly from Java. Other languages, yes. If you've used Nashorn or Scala or um, Kotlin, all of their, their um, uh, internals are, are heavily implemented using this bytecode. But for Java programmers, it, it kind of, it's under the hood. It's something which you don't really, really see that much of, which I think is kind of interesting. Platform Clade, lock and unlock. Ah, where do you think these have come from? No? Synchronized. 
Absolutely. You put an object on the top of the stack, and then you call monitor enter to lock the object. So start up a synchronized block. Monitor exit is called at the end when the lock is released. I'm just about out of time. I did want to leave a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll just let you know that there's also a final fifth clade called wide. And wide actually has the ability to carry another bytecode to work around some restrictions in the constant pool. You can actually access more data and a larger amount of the constant pool than the original design lets you, but only because this guy can carry one of his friends on his back. So the next time that you see one of these class files, just remember who's living inside it. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, we, we are at time, but I actually I do have a couple of books still to give away. So does anyone have a question? Could be worth your while. Yes. Ah, okay, so, so Java P is the standard tool. So if you've, have, you, have you used that? No, okay. So Java P is the standard tool which ships with the, um, uh, with the toolkit. Um, I also have uh, a partial teaching implementation of a VM called Ocelot, which basically has got some tools in it which lets you, lets you execute simple bytecodes. It's not fully working yet. Um, I'm still having, a, 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 but I've only, I haven't been working on it much lately. Um, but it's, it's there as, a, as a, a teaching aid if you want to have a play with seeing how you'd write, you know, just a, a test interpreter to, to play with some of this stuff. Yeah? Another, another question. Uh, yes? How all these changes with this new VM Cloud VM? Ah. Okay, excellent question. Um, you get a book. One more to go after this. Um, so Graal VM. H hands up. Who knows about Graal VM? Only a few people. Okay. So Graal is several things, okay? It's a project which has come out of Oracle Labs, um, and it's, it's two separate products that you need to care about. It's, it's a new JIT compiler, well, sorry, a new compiler for, for Java, which can run both as part of the main hotspot product, but also independently. So you can plug it into to, to hotspot and use it as a replacement for the standard server compiler, what's properly called C2. Um, and if you, you do that, it plugs into a thing called the JVM CI, the, the JVM compiler interface. What's weird about Graal is it's written in Java. Okay? But it's a JIT compiler. And what does a JIT compiler do? Well, a JIT compiler takes in a byte array of bytecode and outputs a byte array of machine code. Okay? Hopefully this won't fry your brains too much. The first thing it compiles is itself. Okay? Because it's an array of bytes. The classes which make up Graal are themselves subject to JIT compi compilation by the Graal compiler running in interpreted mode. So all you need is a very simple interpreter, and it doesn't matter how simple and how slow it is, providing the Graal compiler itself is fast. Because once Graal has compiled itself to native code, the interpreter doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, and then the other, the other piece of that is Graal VM, which basically is a, a combination of things. It's a combination of the Graal compiler, um, some interoperability pieces to allow you to develop fast runtimes for other languages which aren't Java, and a simple VM called Substrate, which basically is very thin, very small, which basically all these other pieces run on top of. The bytecode set um, for the, the, the Substrate VM, which, is, which does have Java bytecode capability, um, is just the same as this, this instruction set. The instruction set won't change, I wouldn't think, for, for Substrate, because it's how, it's how Graal the compiler gets bootstrapped. Um, I've got a big piece coming out about this next week, so if you follow my info key page, um, I've got a major article coming out about, about Graal next week. Okay, one final question. We've got one more book to give away. Uh, uh, Java myth, a myth, uh, true or not? It's invoke a static faster than any other invoke. Ah, great question. So that's three great questions. Um, okay. The question was, is invoke static faster than anything else? Um, the answer is, that's the wrong question. Okay? And th oh, this is not as swift as it sounds. The point is, th think of the name of the VM. The name of the VM is Hotspot. 
right? Because what it does is it compiles the parts of your program that are hotspots. So by definition, anything which is in interpreted state is not an important part of your program. Yeah? So interpreted performance of these opcodes doesn't matter, almost by definition. Yeah? Yep, okay, thank you everyone.